Osiris to knowledge to be gained, and to rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. Webisode Bina, a Beckley Beacon, from multi-species symbionts to moon explorers. Previously on Our Great Salvation. Our great salvation is the product of a possible future harmonization epoch in human history. This storytelling video series has been transmitted backwards in time to 2013, to what may become the beginning of the end of your troubled civilization epoch. To ensure against temporal identity paradoxes, throughout our storytelling, we have employed synthetic voices, and used found imagery from the early 21st century. Our protagonist Phobina originates in another universe, now known as Universe P in her honor, concordant with humankind's M-theory string landscape multiverse. This series is a revoiced retelling of a recent campfire announcement of the part Phobina has played in helping humanity to successfully transcend its troubled civilization epoch. contact science directorate are still hard at work, assimilating the information and technology from Fombina's inter-universe spanning spacecraft, a task which will likely take decades to complete, and they have already confirmed that her vehicle does indeed seem to have originated in Universe P, next door to our own. Luckily for her, and also for us, her universe's compactified extra extra small dimensions seem to be shaped very similarly indeed to ours, although it's still a hotly debated topic as to exactly how matter from one universe executed the transition to existing in another universe with variant fundamental physics. But the presence of Phobina here on Earth, and the priceless treasure trove of information which her endeavor has delivered, are the most compelling evidence of two hitherto unknown facts. Not only are we not alone is the only place where life arose, our whole universe is not alone either. Does that cover your question, Fiona? Aye, so it does, and then some, thanks very much Tom. To be honest, I reckon I only grasped less than half of your explanation, but it's all new to me and you've fair whetted my appetite to learn much more about it all, so fair play to you. Now what say we let Moira get back to telling the story, eh? Yes please. Yeah, let's Come hear the now. story. Tell it like it is story, tell her. Grand so, good on you Tom. I'm now with Fiona, I've a fierce yearning for learning about the scientific background as well. So, now we know the what and which of how we've at least two inhabited universes. What say we start our tale afresh, a long long time ago, in a universe far far away. Episode one. Calamity there once lived a race of beings called the Elders. We only know of them thanks to our comrade Phobina, who carried with her reports of her people's archaeological discoveries on their neighboring moon. Were it not for the actions of the Elders, our two universes would have collided 4.5 billion years ago, destroying everything within both. Even if the calamity had been averted otherwise, then Earth would be moonless, and therefore probably lifeless too. So it's no stretch at all to say we owe the Elders a humongous debt of gratitude, not only for our universe's ongoing existence, but also for our beautiful Moon, whose beneficial effects on making Earth a haven in which intelligent life could evolve are manifold. Across the inter-universe void, in Universe P, 
for Venus people call their home world Fufnathalex. It is a large rocky moon, in orbit around a gas giant planet, not unlike our own Jupiter, which in its turn orbits its parent star within what planetary scientists call the habitable, or Goldilocks zone, not too cold, not too hot, but just right for liquid water to exist on a rocky world surface, and on Flufnathalex, as on Earth, there is liquid water in abundance, vast oceans of it. Extrapolating from our knowledge of life on Earth, our own exobiologists have long thought that a world with liquid water in abundance has a high likelihood of harboring life. In their spacefaring explorations, both Phobina's people, the Matardii, and the elders before them, have discovered this to be true in Universe P. Plufnothalex itself has a biosphere as rich in biodiversity as was our own before civilization's mass extinction event began driving our co-evolved travelers on spaceship Earth into oblivion. A most significant difference between our worlds involves the evolution of the kind of intelligence upon which we humans pride ourselves. On Flufnothalex, the Matardii co-evolved in an intelligence-enhancing, facultative and conjunctive endosymbiosis with a small number of other species. This means that they live inside their host's body, enfolding and bonding with their host's brain, and generally more than doubling their host's native intelligence. The price the host pays, in nutrients lost and increased gas exchange overheads, is a small one indeed, compared to the great boost in cognitive function that being blessed with a Muktardii symbiont confers. The hosts with whom the Muktardii have had the most productive and expansive relationship are the Hulgothii, six-limbed amphibians who are, natively, almost as at home in the oceans, as they are on dry land, or with a Muktardii symbiont on board, in space exploration too. Now we just imagine for a moment, if you will, that we humans could all intimately share the worldview of a wild Asian elephant, an African gorilla, an Andean condor, and an Atlantic dolphin, by getting inside their heads, and also that doing so was commonplace across all human societies. What effect would such a mind-melding ability have on our collective ethics regarding humankind's relationship with what we call the natural world? What might be different, do you think? The hunting, shooting and fishing blood sports atrocity wouldn't have happened, for starters, and neither would the killing of dolphins as a byproduct of industrial scale commercial fishing operations be tolerated. Very good, I couldn't agree more, and what else? If it extended to cattle, pigs, goats, and sheep, our agriculture would likely be all arable farming, and we'd be vegetarians, rather than omnivores. That's a choice a lot more people are making now, anyway, since the revolution. Well said, Belle. Anything else, even more broadly? You've mentioned it a couple of times already, I reckon. Much of the damage our ancestors did to our biosphere arose from catastrophic climate chaos events, like wildfires, hurricanes and typhoons, and man-made climate change occurred because only a few folk challenged the My species, right or wrong ideology of the money damn powerful elite. If we could really commune deeply with other animals, and we all did so commonly, then driving any species into the annihilation of extinction, just to suit our own needs regardless of the ecological cost, would very likely be a huge taboo, so civilization's mass extinction event would probably never have occurred. Excellent. Nicely put Lee. Indeed. The whole anti-ecological false dichotomy between the human world and the natural world, predicated on the specious chauvinist theological principle that humanity is to subdue the earth and have dominion over all other life forms, has no analogue whatsoever on Flufnathalex. The Muktodii ability to cognitively enhance a range of co-evolved species means that they never developed any of the species chauvinist cultural flaws which so potentiated our anthropogenic mass extinction in the civilization epoch, an empathic multi-species comprehension of the ecological interconnectedness of their home world's biosphere means they never saw themselves as separated from, and better than, their natural environment. Making best use of the two fingers and a thumb who got the eye analog of our hands, the Muktodii built up a highly technological culture by socialized collaboration and cooperation, rather than by anti-social competition and exploitation. 
when they began to explore their cosmic environment at electromagnetic frequencies outside the whole Gothi I optical spectrum, a shocking discovery was made, a slowly pulsed, narrow band, carrier signal, at exactly the frequency of their hydrogen atoms microwave emission line, that would be the 1420 MHz, 21 centimeter line in our universe, and very clearly a sign of an extraterrestrial intelligence signaling over here, listen to this. However, the signal's modulation only revealed a repetition of the first 25 prime numbers, and since it was coming from the direction of Flufnothalex's outermost sister moon, the Mokhtardi I concluded it was a beacon, inviting any sufficiently technologically advanced society to investigate its origins. Nothing ignites a space program like a radio beacon broadcasting from a local neighborhood world. The first robotic orbital and lander vehicles discovered the signal's origin to be the ruins of a pyramid, constructed at the moon's north pole, but the doors of an entrance gateway remained intact and unyielding, barring access to the interior. Fobina has kindly translated for us the transcript of testimony by the expedition commander of the first space mission to touch down in the mysterious pyramid's vicinity, as played for us now by Samantha. We approached the gateway with optimistic caution, and as soon as the glove of my spacesuit touched the outer door, we all experienced a synchronous, brief, but unmistakably artificial transient wave of stimulated excitation, passing through the brain and body of our whole guthy eye hosts, as if satisfied that we qualified for entry, the doors slid smoothly aside closing behind us as we entered an antechamber, a similar non-destructive interior scanning investigation then occurred, but more slowly and with greater deliberation, and one at a time, lingering on the amalgam of our host's brains and ourselves. We began to hear a hissing from ceiling-mounted vents, and moments later, my science officer declared the room to be filled with a breathable mixture of gases, matching Flusnathalex atmospheric composition and sea level pressure. A disembodied synthetic voice bid us. Welcome to Universe Defense Facility 94. Speaking at first in broken Mukhtardii, but with gradually improving fluency, it offered safety and security assurances, before requesting that we leave your spacesuits in the side outcomes provided. After we complied, the inner doors opened, and the facility's governing artificial intelligence welcomed us to a guided tour of an extensive but long deserted subsurface base. Without ever naming its progenitors, the UDF-94 AI explained how its creators had discovered a process they called escalation, by which their consciousness could transcend their corporeal bodies, to enjoy immortality in a multiverse-spanning higher realm of existence, before winking out of an existence tied to Universe P their compassion for the widespread astrobiology which they had discovered through space exploration led them to a determination to pass on their universe defense network, these beings we chose to call the Elders. We were invited to return to our home world with a copy of the UDF-94 operations manual and science archive packet. Before we even contemplate adding payload to our return flight, We'd need to examine what's inside of this UDF-94 package. The UDF-94 operations manual and science archive package is a quantum computer containing a tamper-proof, subatomically encrypted information warehouse. The computer is running a species assessment gatekeeper artificial intelligence, or SAG AI. Once you create an interface between your worldwide cultural communications network and the packages SAG AI, then it will begin to analyze your culture. By testing against a variety of xenomorph cultural wisdom criteria developed by my creators, the SAG AI will determine when, if ever, to permit you to access the UDF-94 operations manual and science archive by unlocking, decrypting, and serving its information on your communications network. After much debate, our mission controllers sanctioned the return space flight payload edition of the UDF-94 operations manual and science archive package. So, with some trepidation, we freighted the alien device back to Flufnothalex. And 
Web is beta.